story thirty five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty five budge and toddy at aunt alice's part one the following is quoted by permission from mr haberton's popular book other people's children published by g p putnam sons new york mrs burton's birthday dawned brightly and it is not surprising that as it was her first natal anniversary since her marriage to a man who had no intention or ability to cease being a lover it is not surprising that her ante-breakfast moments were too fully and happily occupied to allow her to even think of two little boys who had already impressed upon her their willingness and general ability to think for themselves as for the young men themselves they awoke with the lark and with a heavy sense of responsibility also the room of mrs burton's chambermaid joined their own and the occupant of that room having been charged by her mistress with the general care of the boys between dark and daylight she had gradually lost that faculty for profound slumber which so notably distinguishes the domestic servant from all other human beings she had grown accustomed to wake at the first sound in the boys room and on the morning of her mistress's birthday the first sound she heard was tod no response could be heard but a moment later the chambermaid heard tod ow drawled a voice not so sleepily but it could sound aggrieved wake up dear old toddy butter it's aunt alice's birthday now needn't wake my ears open if tis whined toddy i only hollered in one ear tod remonstrated budge and you ought to love dear aunt alice enough to have that hurt a little rather than not wake up a series of groans snarls whines grunts snorts and remonstrances semi-articulate were heard and at length some complicated wriggles and convulsive kicks were made manifest to the listening ear and then budge said that's right now let's get up and get ready say do you know that we didn't think anything about having some music don't you remember how papa played the piano last mamma's birthday when she came downstairs and how happy it made her and we danced around all right said toddy let's tell you what said budge let's both bang the piano like mamma and aunt alice does together sometimes oh yes exclaimed toddy we can make some awful big bangs before she can get down to tell us to don't then there was heard a scurrying of light feet as the boys picked up their various articles of clothing from the corners chairs bureau table etc where they had been tossed the night before the chambermaid hurried to their assistance and both boys were soon dressed a plate containing bananas and another with the hard-earned grapes were on the bureau and the boys took them and tiptoed down the stair and into the drawing-room gracious said toddy as he placed his plate on the sideboard maybe the grapes and buttonholes has got sour i guess we'd better try em like mamma does the milk on hot mornings when the baddy milkman don't come time enough and toddy suited the action to the word by plucking from a cluster the handsomest grape in sight i think said he smacking his lips with the suspicious air of a professional wine taster i think they is getting sour let's see said budge no said toddy plucking another grape with one hand while with the other he endeavoured to cover his gift i's bid enough to do it myself unless he added as a happy inspiration struck him you let me help see if your buttonos are sour then you can only have one bite said budge you must let me taste about six grapes because twould take that many to make one of your bites on a banana all right said toddy and the boys proceeded to exchange duties budge taking the precaution to hold the banana himself so that his brother should not abstractedly sample a second time and toddy doling out the grapes with careful count they are a little sour said budge with a wry face perhaps some other bunch is better i think we'd better try each one don't you and each one of the buttonos too suggested toddy that one was pretty good but maybe some of the others isn't 
the proposition was accepted and soon each banana had its length reduced by a fourth and the grape clusters displayed a fine development of wood then budge seemed to realize that his present was not as sightly as it might be for he carefully closed the skins at the ends and turned the unbroken ends to the front as deftly as if he were a born retailer of fruit this done he exclaimed oh we want our cards on em else how will she know who they came from we'll be here to tell her said toddy ah said budge that wouldn't make her half so happy don't you know how when cousin florence gets presents of flowers she's always happiest when she's looking at the card that comes with em all right said toddy hurrying into the parlor and returning with the cards of a lady and gentleman taken haphazard from his aunt's card receiver now we must write happy birthday on the backs of em said budge exploring his pockets and extracting a stump of a lead pencil now continued budge leaning over the card and displaying all the facial contortions of the unpractised writer as he laboriously printed in large letters speaking as he worked a letter at a time h a p p e b u r f d a happy birthday now you must hold the pencil for yours or else it won't be so sweet that's what mamma says toddy took the pencil in his pudgy hand and budge guided the hand and the two juvenile heads touched each other and swayed and twisted and bobbed in unison until the work was completed now i think she ought to come said budge breakfast time was still more than an hour distant why the rising bell hasn't rung yet let's ring it the boys fought for possession of the bell but superior might conquered and budge marched up and down the hall ringing with the enthusiasm and duration peculiar to the amateur bless me exclaimed mrs burton hastening to complete her toilette how time does fly sometimes mr burton saw something in his wife's face that seemed to call for lover-like treatment but it was not without a sense of injury that he exclaimed immediately after as he drew forth his watch i declare i would make a half a david that we hadn't been awake half an hour i forgot to wind up my watch last night the boys hurried into the parlor i hear em trampin around exclaimed budge in great excitement there the piano shut isn't that too mean oh i'll tell you here's uncle harry's violin then what's i going to play on asked toddy dancing frantically about wait a minute said budge dropping the violin and hurrying to the floor above from which he speedily returned with a comb a bound volume of the portfolio lay upon the table and opening this budge tore the tissue paper from one of the etchings and wrapped the comb in it there said he you fiddle and i'll blow the comb goodness why don't they come down oh we forgot to put pennies under the plate and we won't know how many years old to put em for and we ain't got no pennies said toddy i know said budge hurrying to a cabinet in a drawer of which his uncle kept the nucleus of a collection of american coinage this kind of pennies budge continued isn't so pretty as our kind but they're bigger and they'll look better on a tablecloth now how old do you think she is i dunno said toddy going into a reverie of hopeless conjectures she's about as big as you and me put together well said budge you're four and i'm six and four and six is ten i guess ten'll be about the thing mrs burton's plate was removed and the pennies were deposited in a circle there was some painful counting and recounting and many disagreements additions and subtractions finally the pennies were arranged in four rows two of three each and two of two each and budge counted the threes and toddy verified the twos and budge was adding the four sums together when footsteps were heard descending the stairs budge hastily dropped the surplus coppers upon the four rows placed the plate and seized the comb as toddy placed the violin against his knee as he had seen small itinerant italians do
a second or two later as the host and hostess entered the dining-room there arose a sound which caused mrs burton to clap her fingers to her ears while her husband exclaimed scat then both boys dropped their instruments toddy finding the ways of his own feet seriously compromised by the strings of the violin while both children turned happy faces toward their aunt and shouted happy birthday mr burton hurried to the rescue of his darling instrument while his wife gave each boy an appreciative kiss and showed them a couple of grateful tears then her eye was caught by the fruit on the sideboard and she read the cards aloud mrs frank romery this is like her effusiveness i've never met her but once but i suppose her bananas must atone for her lack of manners why charlie croon dear me what memories some men have a cloud came upon mr burton's brow charlie croon had been one of his rivals for miss mayton's hand and mrs burton was looking a trifle thoughtful and her husband was as unreasonable as newly made husbands are sure to be when mrs burton exclaimed some one has been picking the grapes off in the most shameful manner boys ain't from no romeries and croons said toddy they's from me and budge and we does tasted them to see if got sour in the night where did the cards come from asked mrs burton out of the basket in the parlor said budge but the back is the nice part of em mrs burton's thoughtful expression and her husband's frown disappeared together as they seated themselves at the table both boys wriggled rigorously until their aunt raised her plate and then budge exclaimed a penny for each year you know thirty-one exclaimed mrs burton after counting the heap how complimentary what does you do for little boys on your birthday asked toddy after breakfast was served mamma does lots of things yes said budge she says she thinks people ought to get their own happy by making other people happy and mamma knows better than you you know cause she's been married longest although mrs burton admitted the facts the inference seemed scarcely natural and she said so well anyhow said toddy mamma always has parties on her birthday and we has all the cake we want you shall be happy to-day then said mrs burton for a few friends will be in to see me this afternoon and i am going to have a nice little lunch for them and you shall lunch with us if you will be very good until then and keep yourselves clean and neat all right said toddy isn't it most time now tod's all stomach said budge with some contempt say aunt alice i hope you won't forget to have some fruit cake that's the kind we like best you'll come home very early harry asked mrs burton ignoring her nephew's question by noon at furthest said the gentleman i only want to see my morning letters and fill any orders that may be in them what are you going so early for uncle harry asked budge to take aunt alice writing old boy said mr burton oh just listen tod won't that be jolly uncle harry's going to take us riding i said i was going to take your aunt alice budge said mr burton i heard you said budge but that won't trouble us any she always likes to talk to you better than she does to us when are we going mr burton asked his wife in german whether the lawrence burton assurance was not charmingly natural and mrs burton answered in the same tongue that it was but was none the less deserving of rebuke and that she felt it to be her duty to tone it down in her nephews mr burton wished her joy of the attempt and asked a number of searching questions about success already attained until mrs burton was glad to see toddy come out of a brown study and hear him say i think that place where the river is broke off is the nicest place what does the child mean asked his aunt don't you know where we went last year and you stopped us from seeing how far we could hang over uncle harry said the budge oh passaic falls exclaimed mr burton yes that's it said budge old rivers broke right in two there said toddy and a piece of us way up in the air and another piece is way down in big hole in the stones that's where i want to go waden listen toddy said mrs burton we like to take you riding with us at most times but to-day we prefer to be alone you and budge will stay at home we shan't be gone more than two hours 
wants to go a widen exclaimed toddie i know you do dear but you must wait until some other day said the lady but i want to go toddie explained and i don't want you to so you can't said mrs burton in a tone which would reduce any reasonable person to hopelessness but toddie in spite of manifest astonishment remarked want to go a widen now the fight is on murmured mr burton to himself then he rose hastily from the table and said i think i'll try to catch the earlier train my dear as i am coming back so soon mrs burton arose to bid her husband good-bye and was kissed with more than usual tenderness and then held at arm's length while manly eyes looked into her own with an expression which she found untranslatable for two hours at least mrs burton saw her husband fairly on his way and then she returned to the dining-room led toddie into the parlour took him upon her lap wound her arms tenderly about him and said now toddie dear listen carefully to what aunt alice tells you there are some reasons why you boys should not go with us to-day and aunt alice means just what she says when she tells you you can't go with us if you were to ask a hundred times it would not make the slightest bit of difference you cannot go and you must stop thinking about it toddie listened intelligently from beginning to end and replied but i want to go and you can't that ends the matter now i don't said toddie not a single biddle i want to go badder never but you are not going i want to go so baddy said toddie beginning to cry i suppose you do and auntie is very sorry for you said mr burton kindly but that does not alter the case when grown people say no little boys must understand that they mean it but what i want is to go a widen with you said toddie and what i want is that you shall stay at home so you must said mrs burton let us have no more talk about it now shouldn't you like to go into the garden and pick some strawberries all for yourself no i like to go widen toddie said mrs burton don't let me hear one more word about riding well i want to go toddie i will certainly have to punish you if you say any more on this subject and that will make me very unhappy you don't want to make auntie unhappy on her birthday do you no but i do want to go a widen listen toddie said mrs burton with an imperious stamp of her foot and a sudden loss of her entire stock of patience if you say one more word about that trip i will lock you up in the attic chamber where you were day before yesterday and budge shall not be with you toddie gave vent to a perfect torrent of tears and screamed ah, i don't want to be locked up and i do want to go a widen toddie suddenly found himself clasped tightly in his aunt's arms in which position he kicked pushed screamed and roared during the passage of two flights of stairs the moment of his final incarceration was marked by a piercing shriek which escaped from the attic window causing the dog jerry to retire precipitately from a pleasing lounging place on the well curb and making a passing farmer to rein up his horses and maintain a listening position for the space of five minutes meanwhile mrs burton descended to the parlour more flushed untidy and angry than one had ever before seen her she soon encountered the gaze of her nephew budge and it was so full of solemnity that mrs burton's anger departed in an instant how would you like to be carried upstairs screaming and put in a lonely room just cause you wanted to go riding asked budge mrs burton was unable to imagine herself in any such position but replied i should never be so foolish as to keep on wanting what i knew i could not have why exclaimed budge are grown folks as smart as all that mrs burton's conscience smote her not over lightly and she hastened to change the subject and to devote herself assiduously to budge as if to atone for some injury which she might have done to his brother an occasional howl which fell from the attic window increased her zeal for budge's comfort under each one however her resolution grew weaker and finally with a hypocritical excuse to budge mrs burton hurried up to the door of toddie's prison and said through the keyhole toddie what said toddie 
will you be a good boy now yes if you take me a widen mrs burton turned abruptly away and simply flew down the stairs budge who waited her at the foot instinctively stood aside and exclaimed my i thought you was going to tumble why didn't you bring him down bring who asked mrs burton indignantly oh i know what you went upstairs for said budge your eyes told me all about it you're certainly a rather inconvenient companion said mrs burton averting her face and i want you to run home and ask how your mamma and baby sister are don't stay long remember that lunch will be earlier than usual to-day away went budge and mrs burton devoted herself to thought and self-questioning unquestioning obedience had been her own duty since she could remember yet she was certain that her will was as strong as toddy's if she had been always able to obey certainly the unhappy little boy in the attic was equally capable why should he not do it perhaps she admitted to herself she had inherited a faculty in this direction and perhaps oh, yes certainly toddy had done nothing of the sort how was she to overcome the defect in his disposition or was she to do it at all was it not something with which no one temporarily having a child in charge should interfere as she pondered an occasional scream from toddy helped to unbend the severity of her principles but suddenly her eye rested upon the picture of her husband and she seemed to see in one of the eyes a quizzical expression all her determination came back in an instant with heavy reinforcements and budge came back a few minutes later his bulletins from home and his stores of experience en route consumed but a few moments and then mrs burton proceeded to dress for her ride to exclude toddy's screams she closed her door tightly but toddy's voice was one with which all timber seemed in sympathy and it pierced door and window apparently without effort gradually however it seemed to cease and with the growing infrequency of his howls and the increasing feebleness of their utterance mrs burton's spirits revived dressing leisurely she ascended toddy's prison to receive his declaration of penitence and to accord a gracious pardon she knocked softly at the door and said toddy there was no response so mrs burton knocked and called with more energy than before but without reply a terrible fear occurred to her she had heard of children who screamed themselves to death when angry hastily she opened the door and saw toddy tear-stained and dirty lying on the floor fast asleep she stooped over him to be sure that he still breathed and then the expression on his sweetly parted lips was such that she could not help kissing them then she raised the pathetic desolate little figure softly in her arms and the little head dropped upon her shoulder and nestled close to her neck and one little arm was clasped tightly around her throat and a soft voice murmured i wants to go a widen and just then mr burton entered and with a most exasperating affection of ingenuousness and uncertainty asked did you conquer his will my dear his wife annihilated him with a look and led the way to the dining-room meanwhile toddy awoke straightened himself rubbed his eyes recognized his uncle and exclaimed uncle harry does you know where we're going this afternoon we're going a widen and mr burton hid in his napkin all of his face that was below his eyes and his wife wished that his eyes might have been hidden too for never in her life had she been so averse to having her own eyes looked into the extreme saintliness of both boys during the afternoon's ride took the sting out of mrs burton's defeat they gabbled to each other about flowers and leaves and birds and they assumed ownership of the few summer clouds that were visible and made sundry exchanges of them with each when the dog jerry who had surreptitiously followed the carriage and grown weary was taken in by his master they even allowed him to lie at their feet without kicking pinching his ears or pulling his tail as for mrs burton no right-minded husband could wilfully torment his wife upon her birthday so she soon forgot the humiliation of the morning and came home with superb spirits and matchless complexion for the little party 
her guests soon began to arrive and after the company was assembled mrs burton's chambermaid ushered in budge and toddy each in spotless attire and the dog jerry ushered himself in and toddy saw him and made haste to interview him and the two got inextricably mixed about the legs of a light jardinier and it came down with a crash and then the two were sent into disgrace which suited them exactly although there was a difference between them as to whether the dog jerry should seek and enjoy the seclusion upon which his heart was evidently intent then budge retired with a face full of fatherly solicitude and mrs burton was enabled to devote herself to the friends to whom she had not previously been able to address a single consecutive sentence mrs burton occasionally suggested to her husband that it might be well to see where the boys were and what they were doing but that gentleman had seldom before found himself the only man among a dozen comely and intelligent ladies and he was too conscious of the variety of such experience to trouble himself about a couple of people who had unlimited ability to keep themselves out of trouble so the boys were undisturbed for the space of two hours a sudden summer shower came up in the meantime and a sentimental young lady requested the song rain upon the roof and mrs burton and her husband began to render it as a duet but in the middle of the second stanza mrs burton began to cough mr burton sniffed the air apprehensively while several of the ladies started to their feet while others turned pale the air of the room was evidently filled with smoke there can't be any danger ladies said mrs burton you all know what the american domestic servant is i suppose our cook with her delicate sense of the appropriate is relighting her fire and has the kitchen doors wide open so that all the smoke may escape through the house instead of the chimney i'll go and stop it the mere mention of servants had its usual effect the ladies began at once that animated conversation which this subject has always inspired and which it will probably continue to inspire until all housekeepers gather in that happy land one of whose charms it is that the american kitchen is undiscernible within its borders and the purified domestic may stand before her mistress without needing a scolding but one nervous young lady whose agitation was being manifested by her feet alone happened to touch with the toe of her boot the turn-screw of the hot air register instantly she sprang back and uttered a piercing scream while from the register there arose a thick column of smoke fire screamed one lady water shrieked another oh shouted several in chorus some ran upstairs others into the rainy street the nervous young lady fainted a business-like young matron who had for years been maturing plans of operation in case of fire hastily swept into a table cover a dozen books in special morocco bindings and hurried through the rain with them to a house several hundred feet away while the faithful dog jerry scenting the trouble afar off hurried home and did his duty to the best of his ability by barking and snapping furiously at every one and galloping frantically through the house leaving his mark upon almost every square yard of the carpet meanwhile mr burton hurried upstairs coatless with disarranged hair dirty hands smirched face and assured the ladies that there was no danger while budge and toddy the former deadly pale and the latter almost apoplectic in colour sneaked up to their own chamber the company dispersed ladies who had expected carriages did not wait for them but struggled to the extreme verge of politeness for the use of such umbrellas and waterproof cloaks as mrs burton could supply fifteen minutes later the only occupant of the parlour was the dog jerry who lay with alert head in the centre of a large turkish chair mrs burton tenderly supported by her husband descended the stair and contemplated with tightly compressed lips and blazing eyes the disorder of her desolated parlour when however she reached the dining-room and beheld the exquisitely set lunch-table to the arrangement of which she had devoted hours of thought in preceding days and weeks she burst into a flood of tears 
i'll tell you how it was remarked budge who appeared suddenly and without invitation and whose consciousness of good intention made him as adamant before the indignant frowns of his uncle and aunt i always think bonfires is the nicest thing about celebrations and todd and me have been carrying sticks for two days to make a big bonfire in the back yard to-day but then it rained and rainy sticks won't burn i guess we found that out last thanksgiving day so we thought we'd make one in the cellar cause the top is all tin and the bottom's all dirt and it can't rain in there at all and we got lots of newspapers and kindling wood and put some kerosene on it and it blazed up beautiful and we was just coming up to ask you all down to look at it when in came uncle harry and banged me against the wall and todd into the coal heap and threw a mean old dirty carpet on top of it and wetted it all over little boys never can do anything nice without being made so don't said toddy dur see what a awful big splinter i got in my hand when i was frawin wood on a fire i didn't cry a bit about it then cause i thought i was making other folks happy like the lord wants little boys to do but they didn't get happy so now i'm goin to cry about the splinter and toddy raised a howl which was as much superior to his usual cry as things made to order generally are over the ordinary supply we had a torch-like procession too said budge we had to have it in the attic but it wasn't very nice there wasn't any trees up there for the light to dance around on like it does on lection day nights so we just stopped and would have felt real doleful if we hadn't thought of the bonfire where did you leave the torches asked mr burton springing from his chair and lifting his wife to her feet at the same time i i don't know said budge after a moment of thought froed em in a closet where the rags is so's not to dirty the nice floor with em said toddy mr burton hurried upstairs and extinguished a smouldering heap of rags while his wife truer to herself than she imagined she was drew budgie to her and said kindly wanting to make people happy and doing it are two very different things budge yes i should think they was said budge with an emphasis which explained much that was left unsaid little boys is goosies for trying to make big folks happy at all said toddy beginning again to cry oh no they're not dear said mrs burton taking the sorrowful child into her lap but they don't always understand how best to do it so they ought to ask big folks before they begin then there will not be no surprises complained toddy say is we going to eat all this supper i suppose so if we can sighed mrs burton i guess we can budgie and me said toddy and won't we be glad all them women's went it away that evening after the boys had retired mrs burton seemed a little uneasy of mind and at length she said to her husband i feel guilty at never having directed the boys devotions since they have been here and i know no better time than the present in which to begin mr burton's eyes followed his wife reverently as she left the room the service she proposed to render the children she had sometimes performed for himself with results for which he could not be grateful enough and yet it was not with unalloyed anticipation that he softly followed her up the stair mrs burton went into the chamber and found the boys playing battering ram each with a pillow in front of him children said she have you said your prayers no said budge somebody's got to be knocked down first then we will a sudden tumble by toddy was the signal for devotional exercises and both boys knelt beside the bed now darlings said mrs burton you have made some sad mistakes to-day and they should teach you that even when you want most to do right you need to be helped by somebody better don't you think so i do said budge lots i don't said toddy more help i gets to worst things is guess i'll do things all alone after this i know what to say to the lord to-night aunt alice said budge dear little boy said mrs burton go on dear lord said budge we do have the awfulest times when we try to make other folks happy 
do please lord please teach big folks how hard little folks have to think before they do things for em and make em understand little folks every way better than they do so that they don't make little folks unhappy when they try to make big folks feel jolly make big folks have to think as hard as little folks do for christ's sake amen oh yes and bless dear mamma and the sweet little sister baby how's that aunt alice mrs burton did not reply and budge on turning saw only her departing figure while toddy remarked now it's my time turn dear lord when i guess to be a little boy ansel up in heaven don't let growed up angels come along whenever i'm doin anything nice for em and say don't or tumble me down in heaps of nasty old black coal there amen it was with a sneaking sense of relief that mrs burton awoke on the following morning and realized that the day was sunday even school teachers have two days of rest in every seven thought mrs burton to herself and no one doubts that they deserve them how much more deserving of rest and relief then must be the volunteer teacher who not for a few hours only but from dawn to twilight has charge of two children whose capacity for both learning and mischief surely equals any school full of boys the realization that she was attempting for a few days only that which mothers everywhere were doing without hope of rest excepting in heaven made mrs burton feel more humble and worthless than she ever had done in her life before but it did not banish her wish to turn the children over to the care of their uncle for the day if mrs burton had been honest with herself she would have admitted that the principal cause of her anxiety for relief was her unwillingness to have her husband witness the failures which she had come to believe were to be her daily lot while trying to train her nephews thoughts of a sunday excursion from participation in which she should in some way excuse herself of volunteering to relieve her sister-in-law's nurse during the day and thus leaving her husband in charge of the house and the children of making that visit to her mother which is always in order with the newly made wife all these and other devices not so practicable came before mrs burton's mind's eye for comparison but they all and together took sudden wing when mr burton awoke and complained of a raging toothache truly pitiful and sympathetic as mrs burton was she exhibited remarkable resignation in the face of the thought that her husband would probably need to remain in his room all day and that it would be absolutely necessary to keep the children out of his sight and hearing then he could find nothing to criticize she might fail as frequently as she probably would but he would know only of her successes End of story 35, part 1. Story 35 of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 35, Budge and Toddy at Aunt Alice's, part 2. A light knock was heard at Mrs. Burton's door, and then, without waiting for invitation, there came in two fresh rosy faces, two heads of disarranged hair, and two long white nightgowns, and the occupant of the longer gown exclaimed, "'Say, Uncle Harry, do you know it's Sunday? What are you going to do about it? We always have lots done for us on Sundays, because it's the only day Papa's home.' yes i i think i've heard uh, something of the kind uh, before mumbled mr burton with difficulty between fingers which covered his aching incisor oh exclaimed toddy i believe he's going to play bear come on budge we've got to be dogs and toddy buried his face in the bed coverings and succeeded in fastening his teeth in his uncle's calf a howl from the sufferer did not frighten off the amateur dog and he was finally dislodged only by being clutched by the throat by his victim that isn't the way to play bear complained toddy you ought to keep on a howlin let me keep on a bitin and then you give me pennies to stop that's the way papa does can you see how tom lawrence can be so idiotic asked mrs burton i suppose i could replied the gentleman if i hadn't such a toothache 
you poor old fellow said mrs burton tenderly then she turned to her nephews and exclaimed now boys listen to me uncle harry is very sick to-day he has a dreadful toothache and every particle of bother and noise will make it worse you must both keep away from his room and be as quiet as possible wherever you may be in the house even the sound of people talking is very annoying to a person with the toothache then you're a baddie woman to stay in here and keep a talkin all the whole time said toddie when it makes poor old uncle harry supper so go away mrs burton's lord and master was not in too much pain to shake considerably with silent laughter over this unexpected rebuke and the lady herself was too thoroughly startled to devise an appropriate retort so the boys amused themselves by a general exploration of the chamber not omitting even the pockets of their uncle's clothing this work completed to the full extent of their ability the boys demanded breakfast breakfast won't be ready until eight o'clock said mrs burton and it is now only six if you little boys don't want to feel dreadfully hungry you had better go back to bed and lie as quiet as possible is that the way not to be hungry asked toddy with wide-open eyes which always accompany the receptive mind certainly said mrs burton if you run about you agitate your stomachs and that makes them restless and so you feel hungry gracious said toddy what lots of things little boys has got to line hasn't they come on budgie let's go put our tummocks to bed and keep em from getting agiterated all right said budge but say aunt alice don't you suppose our stomachs would be sleepier and not so restless if there was some crackers or bread and butter in em there's no one downstairs to get you any said mrs burton oh said budge we can find them we know where everything is in the pantries and storeroom i wish i were so smart sighed mrs burton go ahead get what you want but don't come back to this room again and don't let me find anything in disorder downstairs or i shall never trust you in my kitchen again away flew the children but their disappearance only made room for a new torment for mr burton stopped in the middle of the operation of shaving himself and remarked i've been longing for sunday to come for your sake my dear the boys as you have frequently observed have very strange notions about holy things but they are also by nature quite religious and spiritually minded you are not only this latter but you are free from strange doctrines and the traditions of men the mystical influence of the day will make themselves felt upon those innocent little hearts and you will have the opportunity to correct wrong teachings and instil new sentiments and truths mr burton's voice had grown a little shaky as he reached the close of this neat and reverential speech so that his wife scrutinized his face closely to see if there might not be a laugh somewhere about it a friendly coating of lather protected one cheek however and the troublesome tooth had distorted the shape of the other so mrs burton was compelled to accept the mingled ascription of praise and responsibility which she did with a sinking heart i'll take care of em while you're at church my dear said mr burton they're always saintly with sick people mrs burton breathed a sigh of relief she determined that she would extemporize a special children's service immediately after breakfast and impress her nephew as fully as possible with the spirit of the day then if her husband would but continue the good work thus begun it would be impossible for the boys to fall from grace in the few hours which remained between dinner-time and darkness full of her project and forgetting that she had allowed her chambermaid to go to early mass and promised herself to see that the children were dressed for breakfast mrs burton at the breakfast-table noticed that her nephews did not respond with their usual alacrity to the call of the bell recalling her forgotten duty she hurried to the boy's chamber and found them already enjoying a repast which was remarkable at least for variety on a small table drawn to the side of the bed was a pie a bowl of pickles a dish of honey in the comb and a small paper package of cinnamon bark 
and with spoons knives and forks and fingers the boys were helping themselves alternately to these delicacies seeing his aunt toddy looked rather guilty but budge displayed the smile of the fully justified and remarked now you know what kind of meals little boys like aunt alice i hope you won't forget it while we're here what do you mean exclaimed mrs burton sternly by bringing such things upstairs why said budge you told us to get what we wanted and we supposed you told the truth uh, i ain't as hungry as i was remarked toddy but my tummock feels as if it growed big and got little again every minute or two and it hurts i wishes we could put tummocks away when we get done usin em like we do hats and overshoes to sweep the remains of the unique morning lunch into a heap and away from her nephews was a work which occupied but a second or two of mrs burton's time this done two little boys found themselves robed more rapidly than they had ever before been arrived at the breakfast-table they eyed with withering contempt an irreproachable cutlet some crisp brown potatoes of wafer-like thinness and a heap of rolls almost as light as snowflakes we don't want none of this kind of breakfast said budge of course we don't said toddy when we're so awful full of other things i don't know where i was going to put my dinner when it comes time to eat it don't fret about that todd said budge don't you know papa says that the bible says something that means don't worry till you have to mrs burton raised her eyebrows with horror not unmixed with inquiry and her husband hastened to give budge's sentiment its proper biblical wording sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof mrs burton's wonder was allayed by the explanation although her horror was not and she made haste to say boys we will have a little sunday school all by ourselves in the parlor immediately after breakfast hooray shouted budge and will you give us a ticket and pass around a box of pennies just like they do in big sunday schools i suppose so said mrs burton who had not previously thought of these special attractions of the successful sunday school let's go right in todd said budge cause the dog's in there i saw him as i came down and i shut all the doors so he couldn't get out we can have some fun with him for sunday school begins both boys started for the parlor door and guided by that marvellous instinct with which providence arms the few against the many and the weak against the strong the dog jerry also approached the door from the inside as the door opened there was heard a convulsive howl and a general tumbling of small boys while at almost the same instant the dog jerry flew into the dining-room and hid himself in the folds of his mistress's morning robe two or three minutes later budge entered the dining-room with a very rueful countenance and remarked i guess we need that sunday school pretty quick aunt alice the dog don't want to play with us and we ought to be comforted some way they're grown people all over again remarked mr burton with a laugh what do you mean demanded mrs burton only this that when their own devices fail they're in a hurry for the consolation of religion said mr burton may i visit the sunday school i suppose i can't keep you away sighed mrs burton leading the way to the parlor boys said she greeting her nephews first we'll sing a little hymn what shall it be oh uncle ned said toddy promptly oh that's not a sunday song said mrs burton i think tis said toddy cause it says three or four times he's gone where de good niggers go and that's heaven you know so it's a sunday song i think glory glory hallelujah is nicer said budge and i know that's a sunday song cause i've heard it in church all right said toddy and he immediately started the old air himself with the words there lies the whiskey bottle empty on the shelf but was suddenly brought to order by a shake from his aunt while his uncle danced about the front parlor in an ecstasy not directly traceable to toothache that's not a sunday song either toddy said mrs burton the words are real rowdyish where did you learn them round the corner from our house said toddy and you can shing your old songs yourself if you don't like mine 
mrs burton went to the piano rambled among the chords for a few seconds and finally recalled a sunday school air in which toddy joined as angelically as if his own musical taste had never been impugned now i guess we'd better take up the collection before any little boys lose their pennies said budge hurrying to the dining-room and returning with a strawberry box which seemed to have been specially provided for the occasion this he passed gravely before toddy and toddy held his hand over it as carefully as if he were depositing hundreds and then toddy took the box and passed it before budge who made the same dumb show after which budge retook the box shook it listened and remarked it don't rattle i guess it's all paper money to-day placed it upon the mantel reseated himself and remarked now bring on your lesson mrs burton opened her bible with a sense of utter helplessness with the natural instinct of a person given to thoroughness she opened at the beginning of the book but she speedily closed it again the first chapter of genesis had suggested many a puzzling question even to her orthodox mind turning the leaves rapidly passing for conscience sake the record of many a battle the details of which would have delighted the boys and hurrying by the prophecies as records not for the minds of children she at last reached the new testament and the ever new story of the only boy who ever was all that his parents and relatives could wish him to be the lesson will be about jesus said mrs burton little boy jesus or big man jesus asked toddy uh both replied the teacher in some confusion all oh, white said toddy go on there was once a time when all the world was in trouble without knowing exactly why said mrs burton but the lord understood it for he understands everything does he know how it feels to be a little boy asked toddy and be sent to bed when he don't want to go and he determined to comfort the world as he always does when the world finds out it can't comfort itself continued mrs burton entirely ignoring her nephew's question but wasn't there lots of little boys then asked toddy and didn't they used to be comforted as well as big folks i suppose so said mrs burton but he knew if he comforted grown people they would make the children happy i wish he'd comfort you and uncle harry every morning then said toddy go on so he sent his own son his only son down to the world to be a dear little baby i should think he'd have made him a sister baby said judge if he'd wanted to make everybody happy he knew best said mrs burton and while smart people everywhere were wondering what would or could happen to quiet the restless heart of people is restless hearts like restless stomachs interrupted toddy kind o limpy and wabbly i suppose so said mrs burton poor folks said toddy clasping his hands over his waistband i sorry for em while smart folks were trying to think out what should be done continued mrs burton some simple shepherds who used to sit around at night under the moon and stars and wonder about things which they could not understand saw a wonderfully bright star up in the sky was it one of the twinkle twinkle kind or one of the standstill kind asked toddy i don't know said mrs burton after a moment's reflection why do you ask cause said toddy i know what twas there for and it ought to a twinkled cause twinkly star bobs open and shut that way cause they're laughin and can't keep still and i know i'd have laughed if i'd been a star and was goin to make a lot of folks so awful happy go on then said mrs burton looking alternately and frequently at the two accounts of the advent they suddenly saw an angel and the shepherds were afraid should think they would be said toddy everybody gets afraid when they see good people round i spect they thought the angel would say don't in about a minute but the angel told them not to be afraid said mrs burton for he had come to bring good news there was to be a dear little baby born at bethlehem and he would make everybody happy wouldn't it be nice if that angel would come and do it all over again said budge only he ought to pick out little boys instead of sheep fellows i wouldn't be afraid of an angel 
neither would i said toddy but i'd just go round behind him and see how his wings was fastened on then a great many other angels came said mrs burton and they all sang and sang together the poor shepherds didn't know what to make of it but after the singing was over they all started for bethlehem to see that wonderful baby just like the other day we went to see the sister baby yes said mrs burton but instead of finding him in a pleasant home in a nice room with careful friends and nurses around him he was in a manger out in a stable that was cause he was so smart that he could do just what he wanted to and be just what he liked said budge and he was a little boy and little boys always like stables better than houses i wish i could live in a stable always and forever so do i said toddy and sleep in mangers cause then the horses would kick anybody that made me put on clean clothes when i didn't want to they gave us him presents didn't they yes said mrs burton gold frankincense and myrrh why didn't they give him rattles and squeaky balls like folks did butter filly when he was a baby asked toddy because toddy said mrs burton glad of an opportunity to get the sentiment of the story into her own hands from which it had departed very early in the course of the lesson because he was no common baby like other children he was the lord what the lord wants a dear little baby exclaimed toddy yes replied mrs burton shuddering to realize that toddy had not before been taught of the nature of the holy trinity and played around with other little boys continued toddy i i suppose so said mrs burton fearing lest in trying to instil reverence into her nephews she herself might prove irreverent did somebody say don't at him every time he did anything continued toddy no i imagine not said mrs burton because he was always good that don't make any difference said toddy the better a little boy tries to be the more folks say don't to him so i guess nobody had any time to say anything else at all to jesus what did he do next asked budge as deeply interested as if he had not heard the same story many times before oh, he grew strong in body and spirit said mrs burton and everybody loved him but before he had time to do all that an angel came and frightened his papa in a dream and told him that the king of that country would kill little jesus if he could find him so joseph the papa of jesus and mary his mamma got up in the middle of the night and started off to egypt seems to me that egypt was about as bad in those days as europe is now remarked budge whenever papa tells about anybody that nobody can find he says gone to europe i s'pose what did they find when they got there oh, i don't know said mrs burton musing i suppose the papa worked hard for money to buy good food and comfortable resting places for his wife and baby and i suppose the mamma walked about the fields and picked pretty flowers for her baby to play with and i suppose the baby cooed when his mamma gave them to him and laughed and danced and played and then got tired and came and hid his little face in his mamma's lap and was taken into her arms and held ever so tight and fell asleep and that his mother looked into his face as if she would look through it while she tried to find out what her baby would be and do when he grew up and whether he would be taken away from her while it seemed as if she couldn't live at all without having him very closely pressed to her breast and mrs burton's voice grew a little shaky and finally failed her entirely budge came in front of her scrutinized her intently but with great sympathy also and finally leaned his elbows on her knees dropped his face into his own hands looked up into her face and remarked why aunt alice she was just like my mamma wasn't she and i think you are just like both of em mrs burton took budge hastily into her arms covered his face with kisses and totally destroyed another chance of explaining the difference between the earthly and the heavenly to her pupils while toddy eyed the couple with evident disfavor and remarked i think twould be nicer if you'd see if dinner was being got ready instead of stoppin tellin stories and huggin budge my tummock's all got a little again
mrs burton came back to the world of to-day from that of history though not without a sigh while the dog jerry who had divined the peaceful nature of the occasion so far as to feel justified in reclining beneath his mistress's chair now contracted himself into the smallest possible space slunk out of the doorway and took a lively quick step in the direction of the shrubbery toddy had seen him however and told the news to budge and both boys were soon in pursuit noticing which the dog jerry speedily betook himself to that distant retirement which the dog who has experience in small boys knows so well how to discover and maintain as the morning wore on the boys grew restless fought drummed on the piano snarled when that instrument was closed meddled with everything that was within reach and finally grew so troublesome that their aunt soon felt that to lose was cheaper than to save so she left the house to the children and sought the side of the lounge upon which her afflicted husband reclined the divining sense of childhood soon found her out however and budge remarked ah alice if you're going to church seems to me it's time you was getting ready i can't go to church budge sighed mrs burton if i do you boys will only turn the whole house upside down and drive your poor uncle nearly crazy no we won't said budge you don't know what nice nurses we can be to sick people papa says nobody can even imagine how well we can take care of anybody until they see us do it if you don't believe it just leave us with uncle harry and stay home from church and peek through the keyhole go on ally said mr burton if you want to go to church don't be afraid to leave me i think you should go after your experience of this morning i shouldn't think your mind could be at peace until you had joined your voice with that of the great congregation and acknowledged yourself to be a miserable sinner mrs burton winced but nevertheless retired and soon appeared dressed for church kissed her husband and her nephews gave many last instructions and departed budge followed her with his eye until she had stepped from the piazza and then remarked with a sigh of relief now i guess we'll have what papa calls a good old-fashioned time we've got rid of her budge exclaimed mr burton sternly and springing to his feet do you know who you are talking about don't you know that your aunt alice is my wife and that she has saved you from many a scolding done you many a favor and been your best friend oh yes said budge with at least a dozen inflections on each word but everyday friends and sunday friends are kind of different don't you think so she can't make whistles or catch bullfrogs or carry both of us up the mountain on her shoulders or sing roll jordan and do you expect me to do all these things to-day asked mr burton no said budge unless you should get well and feel just like it but we'd like to be with somebody who could do em if he wanted to we like ladies that's all ladies but then we like men that's all men too aunt alice is a good deal like an angel i think and you you ain't and we don't want to be with angels all the time until we're angels ourselves mr burton turned over suddenly and contemplated the back of the lounge at this honest avowal of one of humanity's prominent weaknesses while budge continued we don't want you to get to be an angel so what i want to know is how to make you well don't you think if i borrowed papa's horse and carriage and took you riding you'd feel better i know he'd lend em to me if i told him you were going to drive and if you said you were going with me to take care of me suggested mr burton yes said budge as hesitatingly as if such an idea had never occurred to him and don't you think that up to the top of the hawk's nest rock and out to passaic falls would be the nicest places for a sick man to go when you got tired of riding you could stop the carriage and cut us a cane or make us whistles or find us finkster apples the seed balls of the wild azalea or even send us in swimming in a brook somewhere if you got tired of us hm grunted mr burton 
and you might take things to eat with you suggested toddie and when you got real tired and felt bad you might stop and have a little picnic i think that would be durst a thing for a man with the toothache and we could help you lotch i'll see how i feel after dinner said mr burton but what are you going to do for me between now and then to make me feel better we tell you stories said toddie them's what sick folks always likes very well said mr burton begin right away all right said toddie do you want a sad story or a jolly story anything said mr burton men with a toothache can stand nearly anything don't draw on your imagination too hard don't never draw on imaginations said toddie i only draws on slates never mind give us the story well said toddie seating himself in a rocking chair and fixing his eyes on the ceiling guess i'll tell about abraham and isaac once the lord told a man named abraham to go up the mountain and chop his little boy's throat open and burn him up on an altar so abraham started to go to do it and he made his little boy isaac that he was going to chop and burn up carry the kindling wood he was going to set him afire with and i want to know if you think that was a very nice of him well no said mr burton tell you what said budge you don't ever catch me carrying sticks up the mountain even if my papa wants me to when they got up there said toddie abraham made an altar and put little ikey on it and took a knife and was going to chop his throat open when an angel came out of heaven and said stop a doin that so abraham stopped and ikey scooted and abraham saw a sheep caught in the bushes and he caught him and killed him he wasn't going to climb way up a mountain to kill somebody and not have his knife bluggy a bit and he burned the sheep up and then he went home again i'll bet you isaac's mamma never knew what his papa wanted to do with him said budge or she'd never let her little boy go away in the morning do you want to bet no not on sunday i guess said mr burton now suppose you little boys go out of doors and play for a while while uncle tries to get a nap the boys accepted the suggestion and disappeared half an hour later as mrs burton was walking home from church under escort of old general porcupine and enduring with saintly fortitude the general's compliments about her management of the children there came screams of fear and anguish from the general's own grounds which the couple were passing who can that be exclaimed the general his short hairs bristling like the quills of his titular godfather we have no children i think i know the voices gasped mrs burton turning pale bless my soul exclaimed the general with an accent which showed that he was wishing the reverse of blessings upon souls less needy than his own you don't mean oh i do said mrs burton wringing her hands do hurry the general puffed and snorted up his gravel walk and toward the shrubbery behind which was a fish pond from which direction the sound came mrs burton followed in time to see her nephew budge help his brother out of the pond while the general tugged at a large crawfish which had fastened its claw upon toddy's finger the fish was game but with a mighty pull from the general and a superhuman shriek from toddy the fish's claw and body parted company and the general still holding the ladder tightly staggered backward and himself fell into the pond ow 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 howled toddy clasping the skirt of his aunt's mauve silk in a ruinous embrace while the general floundered and snorted like a whale in dying agonies and budge laughed as merrily as if the whole scene had been provided especially for his entertainment mrs burton hurried her nephews away forgetting in her mortification to thank the general for his service and placing a hand over toddy's mouth it hurts mumbled toddy what did you touch the fish at all for asked mrs burton it was a little baby lobster sobbed toddy and i loves little baby all kinds of them and i want to pet him and then i wanted to grope him why didn't you do it then demanded the lady cause he wouldn't grop said toddy he isn't all gropped yet 
true enough the claw of the fish still hung at toddy's finger and mrs burton spoiled a pair of four-button kids in detaching it while budge continued to laugh at length however mirth gave place to brotherly love and budge tenderly remarked toddy dear don't you love brother budge yes sobbed toddy then you ought to be happy said budge for you've made him awful happy if the fish hadn't caught you the general couldn't have pulled him off and then he wouldn't have tumbled into the pond and oh my didn't he splash bully then you's got to be bited with a fish said toddy and make him tumble in again for me to laugh about you're two naughty boys said mrs burton is this the way you take care of your sick uncle did take care of him exclaimed toddy told him a lovely bible story and you didn't and he wouldn't have had no sunday at all if i hadn't done it and we're going to take him widen this afternoon mrs burton hurried home but it seemed to her that she had never met so many inquiring acquaintances during so short a walk arrived at last she ordered her nephews to their room and flung herself in tears beside her husband murmuring henry and mr burton having viewed the ruined dress with the eye of experience uttered the single word boys what am i to do with them asked the unhappy woman mr burton was an affectionate husband he adored womankind and sincerely bemoaned its special grievances but he did not resist the temptation to recall his wife's announcement of five days before so he whispered train them mrs burton's humiliation by her own lips was postponed by a heavy footfall which by turning her face she discovered was that of her brother-in-law tom lawrence who remarked tender confidences eh huh? well i'm sorry i intruded there's nothing like em if you want to be happy but helen's pretty well to-day and donned to have her boys with her and i'm even worse with a similar longing you can't spare them i suppose the peculiar way in which tom lawrence's eyes danced as he awaited a reply would at any other time have roused all the defiance in alice burton's nature but now looking at the front of her beautiful dress she only said why i suppose we might spare them for an hour or two you poor dear spartan said tom with genuine sympathy you shall be at peace until their bedtime anyhow and mrs burton found occasion to rearrange the bandage on her husband's face so as to whisper in his ear thank heaven end of story thirty five part two story thirty six of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty six sailing upstream the following is quoted by permission from mr haberton's popular book the barton experience published by g p putnam's son new york the superintendency of the mississippi valley woolen mills was a position which exactly suited fred macdonald and it gave him occasion for the expenditure of whatever superfluous energy he found himself possessed of yet it did not engross his entire attention the faculty which the busiest of young men have for finding time in which to present themselves well clothed and unbusinesslike to at least one young woman is as remarkable and admirable as it is inexplicable the evenings which did not find fred in parson wedgwell's parlour were few indeed and if when he was with esther he did not talk quite as sentimentally as he had done in the earlier days of his engagement and if he talked business very frequently the change did not seem distasteful to the lady herself for the business of which he talked was in the main a sort which loving women have for ages recognized as the inevitable and to which they have subjected themselves with a unanimity which deserves the gratitude of all humanity fred talked of a cottage which he might enter without first knocking at the door and of a partnership which should be unlimited 
if he learned in the course of successive conversations that even in partnerships of the most extreme order many compromises are absolutely necessary the lesson was one which improved his character in the ratio in which it abased his pride the cottage grew as rapidly as the mill and on his returns from various trips for machinery there came with fred's freight certain packages which prevented their owner from appearing so completely the absorbed business man which he flattered himself that he seemed then the partnership was formed one evening in parson wedgwell's own church in the presence of a host of witnesses fred appearing as self-satisfied and radiant as the gainer in such transactions always does while esther's noble face and drooping eyes showed beyond doubt who it was that was the giver as the weeks succeeded each other after the wedding however no acquaintance of the couple could wonder whether the gainer or the giver was the happier fred improved rapidly as the schoolboy improves but esther's graces were already of mature growth and rejoiced in their opportunity for development though she could not have explained how it happened she could not but notice that maidens regarded her wonderingly wives contemplated her wistfully frowns departed and smiles appeared when she approached people who were usually considered prosaic yet shadows sometimes stole over her face when she looked at certain of her old acquaintances and the cause thereof soon took a development which was anything but pleasing to her husband fred said esther one evening it makes me real unhappy sometimes to think of the good wives there are who are not as happy as i am i think of mrs mosier and mrs crame and the only reason that i can see is their husbands drink i guess you're right eddie said fred they didn't begin their domestic tyranny in advance as you did bless you for it but why don't their husbands stop asked esther too deeply interested in her subject to notice her husband's compliment they must see what they're doing and how cruel it all is they're too far gone to stop i suppose that's the reason said fred it hasn't been easy work for me to keep my promise eddie and i'm a young man mosier and crame are middle-aged men and liquor is simply necessary to them that dreadful old bunley wasn't too old to reform it seems said esther fred i believe one reason is that no one has asked them to stop see how good harry wainwright has been since he found that so many people were interested in him that day yes drawled fred evidently with a suspicion of what was coming and trying to change the subject by suddenly burying himself in his memorandum book but this ruse did not succeed for esther crossed the room to where fred sat placed her hands on his shoulders and a kiss on his forehead and exclaimed fred you're the proper person to reform those two men oh eddie groaned fred you're entirely mistaken why they laugh right in my face if they didn't get angry and knock me down reformers want to be older men better men men like your father for instance if people are to listen to them father says they need to be men who understand the nature of those they are talking to replied esther and you once told me that you understood mosier and crane perfectly but just think of what they are eddie pleaded fred mosier is a contractor and crane's a steamboat captain such men never reform though they always are good fellows why if i were to speak to either of them on the subject they'd laugh in my face or curse me the only way i was able to make peace with them for stopping drinking myself was to say that i did it to please my wife did they accept that as sufficient excuse asked esther yes said fred reluctantly and biting his lips over this slip of tongue then you've set them a good example and i can't believe its effect will be lost said esther i sincerely hope it won't said fred very willing to seem a reformer at heart nobody would be gladder than i to see those fellows with wives as happy as mine seems to be 
then why don't you follow it up fred dear and make sure of your hopes being realized you can't imagine how much happier i would be if i could meet those dear women without feeling that i had to hide the joy that's so hard to keep to myself the conversation continued with considerable strain to fred's amiability but his sophistry was no match for his wife's earnestness and he was finally compelled to promise that he would make an appeal to crame with whom he had a business engagement on the arrival of crame's boat the excellence before the whistles of the steamer were next heard however esther learned something of the sufferings of would-be reformers and found cause to wonder who was to endure most that mrs crame should have a sober husband for fred was alternately cross moody abstracted and inattentive and even sullenly remarked at his breakfast-table one morning that he shouldn't be sorry if the excellence were to blow up and leave mrs crame to find her happiness in widowhood but no such luck befell the lady the whistle signals of the excellence were again heard on the river and the nature of fred's business with the captain made it unadvisable for fred to make an excuse for leaving the boat unvisited it did seem to fred macdonald as if everything conspired to make his task as hard as it could possibly be crame was already under the influence of more liquor than was necessary to his well-being and the boat carried as passengers a couple of men who though professional gamblers crame found very jolly company when they were not engaged in their business calling besides captain crame was running against time with an opposition boat which had just been put upon the river and he appreciated the necessity of having the boat's bar well stocked and freely opened to whoever along the river was influential in making or marring the reputation of steamboats fred finally got the captain into his own room however and made a freight contract so absent-mindedly that the sagacious captain gained an immense advantage over him then he acted so awkwardly and looked so pale that the captain suggested chills and prescribed brandy fred smiled feebly and replied no thank you sam brandy's at the bottom of the trouble i uh here fred made a tremendous attempt to rally himself i want you to swear off sam the astonishment of captain crame was marked enough to be alarming at first then the ludicrous feature of fred's request struck him so forcibly that he burst into a laugh before whose greatness fred trembled and shrank well by thunder exclaimed the captain when he recovered his breath if that isn't the best thing i ever heard yet the idea of a steamboat captain swearing off his whiskey say fred don't you want me to join the church i forgot that you'd married a preacher's daughter or i wouldn't have been so puzzled over your white face to-day sam crane brought down to cold water wouldn't the boys along the river get up a sweet lot of names for me the cold water captain psalm singing sammy and then when an editor or any other visitor came aboard wouldn't i look the thing hauling out glasses and a pitcher of water say fred does your wife let you drink tea and coffee sam exclaimed fred springing to his feet if you don't stop slanting at my wife i'll knock you down good said the captain without exhibiting any signs of trepidation now you talk like yourself again i beg your pardon old fellow you know i was only joking but it is too funny you'll have to take a trip or two with me again though and be reformed not any said fred resuming his chair take your wife along and reform yourself look here now young man said the captain you're cracking on too much steam honestly fred i've kept a sharp eye on you for two or three months and i am right glad you can let whisky alone i've seen times when i wished i were in your boots but steamboats can't be run without liquor however it may be with woolen mills that's all nonsense said fred you get trade because you run your boat on time charge fair prices and deliver your freight in good order who gives you business because you drink and treat the captain being unable to recall any shipper of the class alluded to by fred changed his course tisn't so much that said he it's a question of reputation 
how would i feel to go ashore at pittsburgh or louisville or cincinnati and refuse to drink with anybody why twould ruin me it's different with you who don't have to meet anybody but religious old farmers besides you've just been married and you've been married for five years said fred with a sudden sense of help at hand how do you suppose your wife feels captain crane's jollity subsided a little but with only a little hesitation he replied oh she's used to it she doesn't mind you're the only person in town that thinks so sam said fred captain crane got up and paced his little stateroom two or three times with a face full of uncertainty at last he replied well between old friends fred i don't think so very strongly myself hang it i wish i'd been brought up a preacher or something of the kind so i wouldn't have had business ruining my chances of being the right sort of a family man emily don't like my drinking and i promised to look up some other business but tisn't easy to get out of steamboating when you've got a good boat and a first-rate trade once she felt so awfully about it that i did swear off don't tell anybody for god's sake but i did i had to look out for my character along the river though so i swore off on the sly and played sick i'd give my orders to the mates and clerks from my bed in here and then i'd lock myself in and read novels and the bible to keep from thinking twas awful dry work all around but whole hog or none is my style you know there was fun in it though to think o doing something that no other captain on the river ever did but thunder by the time night came i was so tired of loafing that i wrapped a blanket around my head and shoulders like a hoosier sneaked out the outer door here and walked the guards between towns but i was so frightened for fear some one would know me that the walk did me more harm than good and blue why a whole cargo of indigo would have looked like a snowstorm alongside of my feelings the second day Pon my word fred i caught myself crying in the afternoon just before dark and i couldn't find out what for either i tell you i was scared and things got worse as time spun along the dreams i had that night made me howl and i felt worse yet when daylight came along again toward the next night i was just afraid to go to sleep so i made up my mind to get well go on duty and dodge everybody that it seemed i ought to drink with why the lord bless your soul the first time we shoved off from a town i walked up to the bar just as i always did after leaving towns the barkeeper set out my particular bottle naturally enough knowing nothing about my little game i poured my couple of fingers and dropped it down as innocent as a lamb before i knew what i was doing by george my boy twas like opening the lock gates i was just heavenly gay before morning there was one good thing about it though i never told emily i was going to swear off i was going to surprise her so i had the disappointment all to myself maybe she isn't as happy as your wife but whatever else i've done or not done i've never lied to her it's a pity you hadn't promised her then before you tried your experiment said fred the captain shook his head gravely and replied i guess not why i'd have either killed somebody or killed myself if i'd gone on a day or two longer i suppose i'd have got along better if i'd had anybody to keep me company or reason with me like a schoolmaster but i hadn't i didn't know anybody that i dared trust with a secret like that i hadn't reformed then huh queried fred you why you're one of the very fellows i dodged just as i got aboard the boat i came down late on purpose i saw you out aft i tell you i was under my blankets with a towel wrapped around my jaw in about one minute and was just a-praying that you hadn't seen me come aboard fred laughed but his laughter soon made place for a look of tender solicitude the unexpected turn that had been reached in the conversation he had so dreaded and the sympathy which had been awakened in him by crane's confidence and openness temporarily made of fred macdonald a man with whom fred himself had never before been acquainted a sudden idea struck him sam said he try it over again and i'll stay by you i'll nurse you crack jokes fight off the blues for you keep your friends away i'll even break your neck for you if you like seein as you if it'll keep you straight will you though said the captain with a look of admiration undisguised except by wonder 
you're the first friend i ever had then by thunder how marrying eddie wedgewell did improve you fred but and the captain's face lengthened again there's a fellow's reputation to be considered and where'll mine be after it gets around that i've sworn off reputation be hanged exclaimed fred lose it for your wife's sake besides you'll make reputation instead of lose it you'll be as famous as the red river raft or the mammoth cave the only thing of the kind west of the alleghanies as for the boys tell them i've bet you a hundred that you can't stay off your liquor for a year and that you're not the man to take a dare that sounds like business exclaimed the captain springing to his feet let me drop a pledge said fred eagerly drawing pen and ink toward him no you don't my boy said the captain gently and pushing fred out of the room and upon the guards emily shall do that below there perkins i've got to go up town for an hour see if you can't pick up freight to pay laying up expenses somehow fred go home and get your traps now's the accepted time as your father-in-law has dinged at me many a sunday from the pulpit as sam crane strode toward the body of the town his business instincts took strong hold of his sentiments in the manner natural alike to saints and sinners and he laid a plan of operations against whisky which was characterized by the apparent recklessness but actual prudence which makes for glory in steamboat captains as it does in army commanders as was his custom in business he first drove at full speed upon the greatest obstacles so it came to pass he burst into his own house threw his arms around his wife with more than ordinary tenderness and then looking into her eyes with a daring born of utter desperation said emily i came back to sign the strongest temperance pledge that you can possibly draw up fred macdonald wanted to write out one but i told him that nobody but you should do it you've earned the right to poor girl no such duty and surprise having ever before come hand in hand to mrs crane she acted as every true woman will imagine that she herself would have done under similar circumstances and this action made it not so easy as it might otherwise have been to see just where the pen and ink were or to prevent the precious document when completed from being disfigured by peculiar blots which were neither finger marks nor ink spots yet which in shape and size suggested both of these indications of unneatness mrs crame was not an adept at literary composition and being conscious of her own deficiency she begged that a verbal pledge might be substituted but her husband was firm a contract won't steer worth a cent unless it's in writing emily said he looking over his wife's shoulder as she wrote gracious girl you're making it too thin any greenhorn could sail right through that and all around it here let me have it and crame wrote dictating aloud to himself as he did so and the party of the first part hereby agrees to do everything else that the spirit of this agreement seems to the party of the second part to indicate or imply this he read over to his wife saying that's the way we fix contracts that aren't shipshape emily a steamboat couldn't be run in any other way then crame wrote at the foot of the paper sam crame captain steamer excellence surveyed the document with evident pride and handed it to his wife saying now you see you've got me so i can't ever get out of it by trying to make out that twas some other sam crame that you reformed oh husband said mrs crame throwing her arms about the captain's neck don't talk in that dreadful business way i'm too happy to bear it i want to go with you on this trip the captain shrank away from his wife's arms and a cold perspiration started all over him as he exclaimed oh don't little girl wait till next trip there's an unpleasant set of passengers aboard the barometer points to rainy weather so you'd have to stay in the cabin all the time our cook is sick and his cubs serve up the most infernal messes we're light afraid and have got to stop at every warehouse on the river and the old boat'll be either shrieking or bumping or blowing off steam the whole continual time 
mrs crane's happiness had been frightening some of her years away and her smile carried sam himself back to his premarital period as she said never mind the rest i see you don't want me to go and then she became mrs crane again as she said pressing her face closely to her husband's breast but i hope you won't get any freight anywhere so you can get home all the sooner then the captain called on dr white and announced such a collection of symptoms that the doctor grew alarmed insisted on absolute quiet and conveyed crane in his own carriage to the boat saw him into his berth and gave to fred macdonald a multitude of directions and cautions the sober recording of which upon paper was of great service in saving fred from suffering over the quixotic aspect which the whole project had begun in his mind to take on he felt ashamed even to look squarely into crane's eye and his mind was greatly relieved when the captain turned his face to the wall and exclaimed fred for goodness sake get out of here i feel enough like a baby now without having a nurse alongside i'll do well enough for a few hours just look in once in a while during the first day of the trip crane made no trouble for himself or fred under the friendly shelter of night the two men had a two-hour chat which was alternately humorous business-like and retrospective and then crane fell asleep the next day was reasonably pleasant out of doors so the captain wrapped himself in a blanket and sat in an extension chair on the guards where with solemn face he received some condolences which went far to keep him in good humour after the sympathizers had departed on the second night the captain was restless and the two men played cards on the third day the captain's physique reached the bottom of its stock of patience and protested indignantly at the withdrawal of its customary stimulus and it acted with more consistency though no less ugliness than the human mind does when under excitement and destitute of control the captain grew terribly despondent and fred found ample use for all the good stories he knew some of these amused the captain greatly but after one of them he sighed poor old billy hawkus told me that the only time i ever heard it before and didn't we have a glorious time that night he'd just put all his money into the yenisei that blew up and took him with it only a year afterward and he gave us a new kind of punch he'd got the hang of when he went east for the boat's carpets twas made of two bottles of brandy one whiskey two rum one gin two sherry and four claret with guava jelly and lemon peel that had been soaking in curacao and honey for a month it looks kind of weak when you think about it but there were only six of us in the party and it went to the spot by the time we got through golly but didn't we make rome howl that night fred shuddered and experimented upon his friend with song he was rewarded by hearing the captain hum an occasional accompaniment but as fred got fairly into a merry irish song about one terry o'ran and uttered the lines in which the poet states that the hero took whisky punch every night for his lunch the captain put such a world of expression into a long-drawn sigh that fred began to feel depressed himself besides songs were not numerous in fred's repertoire and those in which there was no allusion to drinking could be counted on half his fingers then he borrowed the barkeeper's violin and played the airs which had been his favorites in the days of his courtship until crane exclaimed say fred we're not playing church give us something that don't bring all of a fellow's dead friends along with it fred reddened swung his bow viciously and dashed into natchez under the hill an old air which would have delighted offenbach but which will never appear in a collection of classical music ah now that's something like music exclaimed captain crane as fred paused suddenly to repair a broken string i never hear that but i think of wesley treepoke that used to run the quitman went afterward to the rising planet when the quitman's owners put her on a new line as an opposition boat wes and i used to work things so as to make louisville at the same time he going up and i going down and then turn about and we'd always had a glorious night of it with one or two other lively boys that we'd pick up 
and wes had a fireman that could fiddle off old natchez in a way that would just make a corpse dance until his teeth rattled and that fireman would always be called in just as we got to the place where you can't tell what sort of whiskey tis you're drinkin and i tell you twas so heavenly that a fellow could forgive the last boat that beat him on the river or stole a landing from him and such whiskey as wes kept used to go cruisin round the back country samplin little lots run out of private stills he'd always find nectar you'd better believe poor old boy the tremens took him off at last he hove his pilot overboard just before he died and put a bullet into pete langston his second clerk they were both trying to hold him you see but they never laid it up against him i wish i knew what became of the whiskey he had on hand when he walked off oh no i don't either what am i thinking about but i do though hanged if i don't fred grew pale he had heard of drunkards growing delirious upon ceasing to drink he had heard of men who in periods of aberration were impelled by the motive of the last act or recollection which strongly impressed them what if the captain should suddenly become delirious and try to throw him overboard or shoot him fred determined to get the captain at once upon the guards no into the cabin where there would be no sight of water to suggest anything dreadful and search his room for pistols but the captain objected to being moved into the cabin the boys said the captain alluding to the gamblers are mighty sharp in the eye and like as not they'd see through my little game and then where'd my reputation be speaking of the boys reminds me of harry ganning that cleaned out that rich kentucky planter at bluff one night and then swore off gambling for life and gave a good-bye supper aboard the boat twas just at the time when prince imperial champagne came out and the whole supper was made of that splendid stuff i guess i must have put away four bottles and if i'd known how much he'd ordered i could have carried away a couple more i've always been sorry i didn't fred wondered if there was any subject of conversation which would not suggest liquor to the captain he even brought himself to ask if crame had seen the new methodist church at barton since it had been finished oh yes said the captain i started to walk mosier home one night after we'd punished a couple of bottles of old crow whisky at our house and he caved in all of a sudden and i laved him out on the steps of that very church till i could get a carriage those were my last two bottles of crow too it's too bad the way the good things of this life paddle off the captain raised himself in his berth sat on the edge thereof stood up stared out of the window and began to pace his room with his head down and his hands behind his back little by little he raised his head drooped his hands flung himself into a chair beat the devil's tattoo on the table sprang up excitedly and exclaimed i'm going back on all the good times i ever had you're only getting ready to try a new kind sam said fred well i'm going back on my friends not on all of them the dead ones would pat you on the back if they got a chance a world without whiskey looks infernally dismal to a fellow that isn't half done living it looks first-rate to a fellow that hasn't got any back down in him curse you i wish i made you back down when you first talked temperance to me go ahead then curse your wife don't be afraid you've been doing it ever since you married her crame flew at macdonald's throat the younger man grappled the captain and threw him into his bunk the captain struggled and glared like a tiger fred gasped between the special efforts dictated by self-preservation sam i promise to see you th through and i'm going to do it if i have to break your neck the captain made one tremendous effort fred braced one foot against the table put a knee on the captain's breast held both the captain's wrists tightly looked full into the captain's eyes and breathed a small prayer for his own safety for a moment or two perhaps longer the captain strained violently and then relaxed all effort and cried fred you've whipped me nonsense whip yourself exclaimed fred if you're going to stop drinking 
the captain turned his face to the wall and said nothing but he seemed to be so persistently swallowing something that fred suspected a secreted bottle and moved an investigation so suddenly that the captain had not time in which to wipe his eyes hang it fred said he rather brokenly how can what's babyish in men whip a full-grown steamboat captain the same way that it whipped a full-grown woolen mill manager once i suppose old boy said macdonald is that so exclaimed the captain astonishment getting so sudden an advantage over shame that he turned over and looked his companion in the face why how are you fred i feel as if i was just being introduced didn't anybody else help yes said fred a woman but you got a wife too crane fell back on his pillow and sighed if i could only think about her fred but i can't whiskey's the only thing that comes into my mind can't think about her exclaimed fred why are you acquainted with her yet i wonder i'll never forget the evening you were married that was jolly wasn't it said crane i'll bet such sherry was never opened west of the alleghanies before or hang your sherry roared fred it's your wife that i remember you couldn't see her of course for you were standing alongside of her but the rest of us well i wished myself in your place that's all did you though said crame with a smile which seemed rather proud well i guess old major pike did too for he drank to her about twenty times that evening let's see she wore a white moire antique i think they called it and it cost twenty-one dollars a dozen and there was at least one broken bottle in every and i made up my mind she was throwing herself away and marrying a fellow that would be sure to care more for whiskey than he did for her interrupted fred ease off fred ease off now there wasn't any whiskey there i tried to get some of the old twin tulip brand for punch but but the devil happened to be asleep and you got a chance to behave yourself said fred crame looked appealingly fred he said tell me about her yourself i'll take it as a favor why she looked like a lot of lilies and roses said fred except that you couldn't tell where one left off and the other began as she came into the room i felt like getting down on my knees old bailey was telling me a vile story just then but the minute she came in he stopped as if he was shot he wouldn't drink a drop that evening said crane and i puzzled my wits over that for five years she looks so proud of you interrupted fred with some impatience did she asked crane well i guess i was a good-looking fellow in those days i know pike came up to me once with a glass in his hand and said that he ought to drink to me for i was the finest looking groom he'd ever seen he was so tight though that he couldn't hold his glass steady and though you know i never had a drop of stingy blood in me it did go to my heart to see him spill that gorgeous sherry she looked very proud of you fred repeated but i can't see why for i've never seen her do it since you will though hang you exclaimed the captain get out of here i can think about her now and i don't want anybody else around no rudeness meant you know fred fred macdonald retired quietly taking with him the keys of both doors and feeling more exhausted than he had been on any saturday night since the building of the mill End of story thirty six